Hello there. Um, in this video, we're going to be discussing some philosophy. Um, now, you might come to the conclusion in the course of this lesson that I am talking nonsense and that I'm making ridiculous statements. Um, and maybe I'm asking you to consider things that, that you think don't deserve your time, um, which is fair enough. I mean, some people find philosophy to be annoying. Um, it's certainly, uh, this lesson is not going to give you any definite facts about the nature of artificial intelligence or intelligence in general. But that's not the job of philosophy. The job of philosophy is to encourage you to question things that you might take to be obvious. Um, we don't often take the time to think about the things that are around us. Um, so sometimes it's nice to take a step back and examine our assumptions. So, so let's do that. So in the course of this series of lessons about AI, um, we have seen lots of different examples that we've presented as examples of artificial intelligence, um, from machines that can play chess, um, machines that can talk to us or can recognize faces. And while we've been doing that, we've been very aware that these machines are each good at one thing in particular. So the chess playing computer doesn't have conversations with us. And uh, computers that recognize things, um, they don't also drive cars. You know, they, they have a limited scope. They have one job that they're very good at, but that's all they do. Um, and we call this weak AI. So this is artificial intelligence that mimics human ability in one limited area. Um, but AI in the movies, so if, if we go to the cinema and, and we see films that have artificial intelligence, um, then they aren't like this. You know, if we think about um, the sorts of computers we, uh, we see in movies, then we have things like um, data from Star Trek. Um, the one at the top right is from the film Ex Machina. Um, actually, the one at the one at the bottom right is um, is is different because that isn't a robot, is it? Um, this is from the film uh, two thousand and one, A Space Odyssey, and that is a computer called HAL, which is uh, in charge of a spaceship. But they are what we call strong AI in the in that they they have personalities, um, they can they can solve problems, they can pretty much understand anything that we can understand. And, you know, in some cases, um, in, in, in the movies, um, artificial intelligence can have relationships, you know, can, can make friends with people, um, can even fall in love. So um, the AI that we're used to seeing in our media really can do anything that we can. Um, but more than this, strong AI is also conscious, as in it's thinking for itself. So it knows what it is, it, it understands what it is, and it also understands what it's doing. So if we think way back to lesson one of our AI lessons, um, I asked you to think about something like a calculator or Wikipedia, and I asked you whether you thought those things were intelligent. And the main objections that people had, the main problems that people had with that idea was that well, first of all, they said that these things haven't actually learned how to do this. So Wikipedia hasn't learned all that information for itself. Um, it's just stuff that has been entered into Wikipedia. And a calculator doesn't really know how to do maths. Um, it's just following instructions. So the idea that, that these are just things that have been programmed, they don't really understand what they're doing, um, they, you know, that they, they haven't learned it for themselves. These are the main reasons why we consider that things like Wikipedia are not intelligent like we're intelligent. Um, of course, I mean, we have seen other examples of computers that can learn. So we've seen programs that can learn how to recognize different objects, that can learn how to play noughts and crosses, and can learn how to beat us. Um, and in, in some cases, they can do things that even the smartest humans can't do. So um, there are machines that can learn, 
But the question is, do they actually understand what they're doing? Are they actually, are they conscious or are they just following instructions? And the question is, you know, will it ever be possible to make a machine that is conscious? And if we can, then should we do that? So to consider, first of all, whether strong AI is even possible, um, let's have a think about an example that was uh, created by uh, a mathematician and philosopher called John Searle. Um, and he asked us to imagine the following situation. Um, imagine that I'm sitting in a room with lots of boxes of Chinese characters um, written on, on bits of paper and a big book of instructions. So that's what's happening here in this left-hand picture. Now, I don't understand the Chinese language, but the idea is if a Chinese person writes a question on a piece of paper and sticks it under the door, then I can pick up that question and then I can consult my big book of instructions. And it might say something like, uh, when you see this squiggly character next to this other character, then uh, look through the boxes and find these symbols that show these different characters and then put them together and just put them back under the door. So the book of instructions tells me exactly how to respond to any question that is shoved under the door. And then I write my response and I put it back under the door. Now the person on the other side of the door, when they read my response, they would think that they're talking to a Chinese speaker. Um, if so long as the, the book of instructions gives me the right instructions, I could answer their question and they would have no idea that I don't actually know how to speak Chinese. I've got no idea how to speak Chinese. I'm just following the instructions that are in the book. So you can imagine that if, if, if this was a, a huge room and if, if that book contained instructions that covered every eventuality, you know, if it had uh, instructions for telling jokes, solving problems, um, even, you know, falling in love and, and, and having, a, having a, a, a relationship, a friendship. So whatever conversation that the person outside wanted to have, I would be able to find the right symbols or, you know, good enough to convince them that I understood what they were saying. But I still wouldn't actually know how to speak Chinese because all I'm doing is I'm just moving symbols around. I don't even know what the symbols mean. So um, you'll recall that we watched, uh, we watched a video um, where a computer called, Je uh, a computer called Watson uh, was playing the game show Jeopardy and it managed to beat two quiz champions at Jeopardy. And in fact, after that was, was broadcast, after that Jeopardy program was broadcast, John Searle, the man who came up with the, the Chinese room experiment, uh, he wrote an article entitled, Watson doesn't know that it won on Jeopardy. Um, which, you know, it seems fair enough because, you know, Watson is programmed to answer questions. It's not, it, it doesn't know what they mean. Um, it's literally just following instructions to answer those questions. So, you know, you could program a computer like Watson to say the Eiffel Tower is in Paris but all it's really doing is it's it's just moving symbols around you know it's just displaying letters on a screen or it's it's just it's just producing sounds it doesn't actually know anything about about paris you know it isn't it isn't thinking anything um it it, it doesn't even know what eiffel tower means it doesn't it doesn't know that that's a, a tower is a thing that you can climb and that paris is a place where you know, you can go to Paris and they sell nice pastries there. And, you know, this, this, this is an idea um, that's known as semantics. The idea that you know, words don't just have dictionary definitions, but they have ideas associated with them. And a computer can read the words and it can reproduce the words, but it doesn't have any feelings. It doesn't have a sort of an inbuilt understanding about what those things mean. So you, if you accept that the Chinese room argument um, is, is a reasonable argument, then, then it would seem that we could never build a computer that, that thinks and actually has awareness simply by giving it instructions. Um, 
all computers ever do is they move numbers and symbols around. They have incredibly complicated wiring, but that's all that processing is. It's electrical signals moving around, calculations being made, values being stored in memory. So if we can't get consciousness from that, from that process, then we'll never be able to make a machine that can think for itself. Now, some people have argued that the Chinese room experiment is not a good argument because, I mean, even if the person in the room doesn't understand Chinese, you could argue that the room as a whole does understand Chinese. So the, the entire system is not just the person, it's also the book of instructions and the bits of paper. It's the whole room is the system. And that system does understand Chinese because it's able to answer questions. And it's, it's indistinguishable from someone who actually does understand Chinese. And as we saw in the Turing test, um, if, if, if you can ask questions and the thing on the other end acts exactly the same as a real person, then how would you ever know whether they really understood what you were saying? Um, in, in fact, if, if I talk to you, uh, a real human being, and I ask you, do you understand that flowers smell nice and that chocolate is delicious? If you tell me that you do understand those things, well, I've, I've, only, have, I've only got your word for it. <laughs> you know, maybe there's some complicated circuitry going on in your head that's producing that response. And if I ask a computer the same thing, and if a computer says to me, yes, I understand that flowers smell nice and that chocolate is delicious, yeah, how am I supposed to tell the difference? So one area of research in artificial intelligence is to do with simulating what happens in the brain. Because, I mean, our brains are full of complicated circuitry. You know, our brains are made of cells called neurons, which transmit information um, rather like an, an electrical circuit in a computer. And it might be possible for us to create uh, a computer program which copies individual neurons and makes them function in the same way as they do in the brain. And, you know, eventually we might be able to create a simulation of an entire brain. Now, at the moment we don't, but maybe if we were to simulate the way that the brain is built, then rather than writing instructions, we won't literally write instructions to tell it how to do things. We will just allow it to develop like human brains do. We will let it learn. We will let it develop. Um, it might start off like a, like a baby's brain, and then it might develop um, and learn and be able to, to do things just like a human brain can. And, and at that point, it, it will actually understand what the Eiffel Tower is. You know, it will, it will actually, it won't just be following instructions. It will have developed an understanding itself. And who, who knows, maybe this simulated brain will actually want to go to Paris. Maybe that will be something that it wants to do. Um, how would we know? How would we know if it's really thinking those things or if it's just pretending? <laughs> how, will we, how will we be able to test whether it is truly conscious or whether it is just simulating those things really well. Um, I mean, for that matter, I mean, you know, if, if I talk to you as a person, how do I know whether you're really conscious? Maybe you're just pretending really well. Um, but you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that won't be possible. Maybe it's never possible to simulate the brain and create an intelligence. Um, there is a there is an idea called dualism. Uh, it's a philosophical idea called dualism, which argues that we have a spirit or a mind that exists apart from our brains, you know, almost outside of our brains. We have this, this extra mind or spirit. I mean, you could call it a soul. Um, and, you know, if, if that exists, then maybe it might never be possible to create a machine that has a soul or a mind. Or maybe souls or minds 
are things that come into existence when you have a big enough brain to support one. So maybe an ant doesn't have a mind, but when the brain gets bigger, if you have something like a cat, maybe that does have a mind. Maybe it's all to do with the size and complicatedness of your brain. So maybe if we made a complicated enough simulated brain, then a mind would appear. That's something that we may, we may never know. And then of course, we have the question of whether we should try to do this. So what would be the benefit of building a machine that is conscious? Um, at the moment, we have AI that does jobs. You know, it solves problems, uh, recognizes patterns, manages systems. So we don't have to worry about what the AI is feeling, you know, whether it is enjoying itself or whether it's having a nice life because we know that the AIs we're creating can't experience emotions. But maybe if we, if we simulate the brain so that it does become conscious, then surely we would be morally responsible for the well-being of that brain. If, if we manage to create a conscious program, then it might not like being in charge of our heating system or cataloging our photographs or you know, whatever job we give it. We would effectively be creating a slave who might be living a life of torment, even though we might not have actually given it the ability to communicate with us. So this was the topic of an episode of the TV series, Black Mirror. And that, that's what this, this picture is a, a, a clip from, um, in which a, a woman's personality has been copied and stored as a computer program so that it can serve as a digital assistant. And you know, she, she's conscious, but all she has to do all day is run the, is run a house effectively, run the, all the automatic curtains and lights and things in this house and she does not enjoy it. Um, so, I mean, theoretically, a machine consciousness might not even experience time at the same rate as us. So what for us might just be a few seconds might be hours of boredom to a conscious computer. They might be being driven insane with boredom while they're waiting for us to decide whether we should turn the lights on or turn the heating up two degrees, you know. <laughs> Um, and then there's the question of if you have a conscious machine and you turn it off, then are we effectively killing that machine? Should we ever turn off a conscious machine? That's a, that's a bit of a horror story. And there, are, there, there have been many examples of, of fiction, of science fiction, where the idea of a, a conscious machine has raised ethical dilemmas like that. Um, and... I mean, there are huge moral dilemmas involved in simulating brains. So at, at the moment, computer scientists have simulated very small brains, such as those of a, a, a roundworm or sort of small animals. Um, they're, they're close to being able to simulate a, a mouse brain, but they're sort of reaching the limits of current computer power. Um, but they are, they are carrying on, they are proceeding. Um, so, so that's really a taste of the discussion regarding computers and consciousness and what we call strong AI. Um, it's by no means a closed issue. Uh, it's likely to become even more important as computers get faster. Um, that is why uh, computer science and philosophy um, are recognized courses that you can study at quite a few universities. Um, so Oxford University run it and several other universities run uh, philosophy and computer science courses. Um, there's a huge amount of interest in this topic in the future. And if, if you were to go on and study it, maybe you would maybe be involved in creating such intelligent machines or, uh, or even conscious machines, or perhaps you'll be campaigning for them to stop researching this area. <laughs> maybe you feel that this is an area that we really should not be going down. And, uh, and you know, that's an argument that will probably be happening I would say within your lifetime. So either way, I hope that it's given you something to uh, think about. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for listening.